This hashtag life, kind of relating some social media things to a few issues in our lives. And, and again, I'll throw the caveat out, this is not an anti-social media message. It's not an anti-social media series. We use social media. We use it a lot. I'm going to continue to, to use it a lot. believe that there's some fantastic things, not only for our church to, to be able to utilize. You guys, one of the cool things that we're doing now um, on our social media, especially through our YouTube channel and what we post, um, and, and I got it. This is I give credit to Adam on this. It was his heart, and, and I said, "Man, let's chase it. This is awesome." We are going. He is going, and he has made contact with some 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 different preachers and pastors, kind of in our area. Maybe not necessarily in the Ava area, but but in some places. Maybe they're small country churches, and they don't have the opportunity or the ability where they are at that point to record and to post some things, you know, online. And, and we are taking their messages and hosting them on our site. And we're allowing people, and it's really amazing to see the people not only from their own churches utilizing them, but, but, but to see the people that are listening to other. Listen, people have a whole, there's a whole different perspective out there in life and God than just me, amen? And I love the fact that we're able to do that, that Adam takes the time to meet with them. And, and, and again, it, I think it's just fantastic. Uh, there's a young man that preaches down at Sardis, a uh, general Baptist church that's been on every week. If you have not listened to him, you need to listen to him. A great heart, great perspective. Um, just uh, one of the old pioneers of our, of our, of our area. And, and forgive me, I don't remember his name, but man, you talk about a real message talking about the blessings and the provisions of God and the, and the ways that God has showed up in his life and his ministry. It's amazing. Pastor Buddy Boyd even made an appearance here a few weeks ago on that. And, and so we're just looking for those opportunities to be able to share, to give other people an opportunity to share. So we're going to use it. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, our app, doesn't matter. We are going to use it. I use it with my family. We stay connected. Um, you all stay connected with family members and friends that we don't get to see. Sometimes we're connected with people that we don't even know. We just hit the accept follow button just to add the number of friends. Because why? We talked about this last week a little bit. It's like that instant gratification that makes us feel good because someone likes me. We go back to our phones and we look for how many likes our post got. How many likes our pictures got? We're going to talk about pictures today. Selfies. Social media can be a good thing. But remember I said last week the average Facebook user spends 35 minutes a day on Facebook itself? That adds up. Adds up a lot. Priorities matter, especially in your relationships. Don't abuse it. Today's hashtag is just be real. Just be real. At Cross Point Church, we're about pointing people to a real relationship with a real God. That's been our motto since day one. Uh, not too long after that, I added a little bit of extra to that, and we do that uh, by being real people sharing a real message. Now, to do that and to, and to just be as real and, and transparent as possible, to be real people sharing a real message means that we are a bunch of misfits, we make mistakes, we don't get it right all the time, we don't make people happy all the time, sometimes we met all these, but that's part of being real. If you go back and you look at the disciples, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago in, 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 in one of our teachings, Jesus called a bunch of misfits, didn't he? He's just looking for us to follow him, be the best that we possibly can, but who we are is who we are. And what comes with me is what comes with me. Some people like me. Some people not so much. But I'm just me. This is me. I'm loud. I get excited. I spit a lot. I do. And it's always, I can see it in the light. It's just like, whoosh. That's why RJ moved back a couple rows this week. But that's just me. It's just me. One of the biggest things today on social media is the selfie. The selfie. Now, I didn't grow up with selfies. I didn't grow up taking selfies. But today, there isn't a day goes by that you're on, on social media that you don't see someone selfie. Sometimes you see 150 selfies a day. Just being real. Now, if you're a selfie taker and a selfie poster, I'm not coming down on you. 
But really, I better stop right there. <laughs> Selfie was the Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year in 2013. The very first documented selfie. Let's post this picture. That's it. True story. Google it. Google it. Go look. Go look. Here's the, here's the story. The image in question was taken in 1839 by an amateur chemist and photography enthusiast from Philadelphia. His name is Robert Cornelius. He set up his camera at the back of a family store in Philadelphia, and he took this image by removing the lens cap, because back then there was no click. You had to keep the, the lens covered, because if you, anything, anytime you left the light in, that's what it, this is, it captured the picture. So by removing the lens cap and then running into the frame, he sat for a minute before running back and covering it. And on the back of the image, he wrote, the very first light picture ever taken, 1839. The very first selfie, almost 200 years prior to the internet. Over 100 million selfies are posted to social media every day. It is expected that the average millennial will post 26,000 selfies in their lifetime. That's insane. In 2015, more people died from taking selfies than from shark attacks. There's a tidbit of information for you. We live in a selfie world. If you're younger, maybe my kids, may be difficult for you to understand, but my generation would never have ever taken a selfie. We didn't like our picture taken. And I grew up in a family that takes more pictures than any family in the world in history. Started with my papa. When I was a kid, it, it really started with, with my papa. My papa, he would, <laughs> he'd get these ca cameras and he'd take pictures and, and then he would develop all these pictures and then he would put them in the, you guys remember the little sleeve books that you'd get from Walmart? And then he would mail them to us or he would give them to us and, and it was just picture, 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 picture. And, and while it's, my mom would always say, now you'll be happy that we did this one day. And now my mother just, man, she just, so many, but I can, it, it's kind of a pun thing. And we just, you know, it's time for the family picture. No, it's not. Well, we just grumble, especially me and my sister-in-law. And, and uh, but we go and we smile and we take the picture. And, but in my day, there was no, we didn't, there was no selfie. Because we, we didn't have phones. And but when the, when the phones did come out, they were big enough you beat some over the head with, and then you hurt them. <laughs> Reality is, man, when I grew up, I just didn't like my picture taken. Many of you will remember that the worst day of the year ever when you were a kid was school picture day. Anybody remember school picture day? I hated it. And the reality of that is, is that that picture... That picture, now we're talking, when I mean, you go, mom and dad, they fix you up really good and you go to school looking great, but by the time they take those pictures, you know it does not turn out that way. But that picture is on the wall or the refrigerator all year long. Man, he's cute, isn't he? What happened? Keep rolling, they get better. What? Stop. Look at the hair. <laughs> oh, boy. Things have changed. You can get off that picture now, Karen. <laughs> We're selfie-obsessed. We take a picture of ourselves, and then we put a filter on it. Put a filter on it. Don't we? Some people do. Some people are good at filters. Get the wrinkles away, the bags under the eyes, you can take them away. Change the color. Well, you can make yourself look really good. And then we post it. We post it after the filter because we want people to see who we want them to see. We want them to see who sometimes we really want to be. 
edit the double chin. If you got a zit, man, when I was a kid and had a zit, I either had to pop it or put my mom's makeup on it. <laughs> now you can just edit the thing right out. This is the filtered me I want you to see. But in this selfie-centered world, taking pictures of ourselves, putting filters on, listen, the heart behind this message is this. The more filtered our lives become, the more that we show others the me we want them to see, the more difficult it will become to be authentic, to be real. It's like we get sucked into this alternative life. And that's a scary place to be. So this was our question last week. We'll keep it going this week. How is technology changing our relationships? People are starting to fear and avoid unfiltered communication. Unfiltered communication. See, we don't have the luxury. When I was a kid, we didn't have the luxury to... When the phone rang, you actually had to pick up the phone and answer it to see who it was. And to find out what they wanted, you actually had to talk to them. It's amazing. Today, you can look at your phone and see exactly who's calling you, or if you don't have them in your saved contacts, and you don't recognize the message, you can let it go to voicemail. And then immediately, you listen to your voicemail. And then as soon as you listen to your voicemail, most of the time, we don't call them back. We text them back. You know why that is? Because we can still control the conversation. If you're not speaking to someone, you can control the conversation because there's nothing verbally happening and you're the one that started it. You can end it at any time. You can change it at any time. But that's reality. We begin to fear and avoid unfiltered communication. And the more filtered our lives are, the more difficult it is to be authentic. Yes, I'm bringing the Bible into this really cool story today. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians in chapter 3. But really, Paul in this, in this scripture in the New Testament is talking about Moses in the Old Testament out of Exodus chapter 34. So there's your reading assignment for the week. You can write that down, take that home, read Exodus chapter 34. So Paul's talking about when Moses was, uh, he, he went up to the top of Mount Sinai. He'd received the Ten Commandments with, from God. He'd experienced the very presence of God. I mean, it was just like this amazing thing had happened to him. And after 40 days and 40 nights with God, he came down from the mountain and his face was actually glowing. Just, just, I mean, it's just like he'd spent so much time just right there in the presence of God. And when he came down, it was just like beaming. The glory of God was on his face. Just shining and showing. I'd like to think sometimes when I preach that I'm glowing. But I understand that's the light. It's usually shining off the sweat on my bald head. But he had experienced God in this amazing way. And his face was glowing. And so Moses put on a veil. Put this veil on. Now, I always thought that he put this veil on to protect people from seeing this overwhelming glory of God. I've heard it talked about that way before. And so I, I just got to looking and, and, and I just studied some stuff. And if you look at the text really closely, and this was brand new for me, he actually talked to the people before he put the veil on his face. This is very important. And this just kind of jumped out at me. He actually came down and spoke to the people for a little bit first before he put the veil on him on first. Paul implies that he did not put the veil to protect people from seeing the glory, but he put on the veil to keep them from seeing that the glory was actually starting to fade away. That's different. Watch this. Second Corinthians chapter two verses or chapter three, excuse me, verses thirteen through eighteen. In essence, Moses put a filter over his face so they wouldn't see the truth. Verse thirteen. We're not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. Well, that just kind of jumped at me. 
It says, we're not like Moses who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. Just now, here's, here's another reference. Just as the Old Testament was passing away, so the glory was fading from his face. And we can assume one of the reasons he put the veil on was to keep them from seeing the fading of this glory. Verse 14, but their minds were made dull for, for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed. Because only in Christ is it taken away. Verse 15, even to this day, Paul said, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. And basically right here, what he's saying in this is whenever the Old, Te- oh, the old Covenant is read in the synagogues, the unbelieving Jewish people, they couldn't see the truth because they were blinded from seeing and experiencing this. That's really what he was speaking at that time. But then he goes, he actually said this in, in chapter 4, verse 4. He said, the God of this world, little g God, that's Satan. Okay, the God of this world, in this world, little g God, meaning our spiritual enemy. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the truth. He comes in and he he could put up this veil or more importantly and sometimes more destructively can get us to put the veil up. We put it up ourselves and when we put it up ourselves, all he does is sit back and laugh because we're hiding the real me. Verse 16, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Verse 17, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We're going to go back to this in a little bit. In verse 18, and we all who with unveiled faces, everybody say we. That's important too. We'll go back to that in a minute. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with everlasting glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Unveiled living. But the problem is most of us wear some kind of veil. In fact, most of us have become very skilled at it. Pretty skilled at it. How to filter our lives, show other people the me that we want them to see. And Paul implies that this is what Moses was doing. I'm covering the fact that the glory is fading away. By nature, we're all insecure people, right? All of us are insecure. We, we, we see flaws that other people don't see. Correct? We do. Our biggest critic is the one we look at in the mirror every day, right? You've heard me say that before. It's just a part of who we are. It's the nature of who we are. I mean, we want to look good. We want to present ourselves well. We want people to like us. But yet we are extremely insecure in our lives. We don't feel good about ourselves. When we sin, rather confessing our sin as the first response, by nature, we tend to hide it and put on a veil. We don't want people to see how we're struggling. We don't want people to see, you know, that, that it's just something that, that is just eating us away. So we put on the smiles, we put on the, the happy face, and everything is amazing. Go all the, way, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve messed up, What did they immediately try to do? They didn't immediately go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. They didn't immediately go to God and and stand in front of him and confess. What they immediately did was throw up a veil and put on the fig leaves and then try to hide themselves from God. That was their immediate response. Let's put a veil. If I put this veil up, if we put the fig leaves on and, and we hide our nakedness and then we go in the garden and we get underneath the bush, God will never see us. But we find out through Scripture and the story that that we know that that is not true. But they, in essence, were saying, I don't want you to see the real me. I don't want you to see the me that's messed up. I don't want you to see the me that's sinning. I don't want you to see the me that makes mistakes. And so we hide it. So here's a serious question. What veil are you wearing? What veil or veils, in some instances, some people throw one up and then they go to another crowd of people and they throw another one up. Then they go to another crowd of people and they throw another one up. It's like we're carrying the veil suitcase everywhere we go. What veil are you wearing? What image are you trying to portray in your life that maybe you're really not? Maybe you're a social media man. We're almost trained to do this. For example, you may portray yourself as, hey, I'm a spiritual guy. I'm the spiritual guy. 
I'm the guy that goes to church every Sunday. I'm the guy, man, I got it going on. I'm doing my YouVersion Bible app, and I'm setting it to where everyone can see that I'm doing my YouVersion Devotion Bible app. And when I'm done with one, it'll post on social media to show that I'm doing my devotions and show that I'm reading my Bible. And I'm Mr. Social Media Man. I'm the spiritual guy. But when in reality, in the back of your mind, there's something ongoing that is secret, some secret mistake, some secret sin. Maybe it's selfishness. Maybe your self-worth is just horrid. You think you, you just don't don't think very good about yourself, but, but, but yet you're portraying this and it haunts you and it makes you crazy. But hey, let's take the selfie of social media man. Or maybe you're got it together mom. Hey, look, here's a picture of my cake for my kids. Here's me at the ball game with my kids and here's the awesome gifts that I bought my kids. But when in reality, you feel guilty because you're overwhelmed. You feel overworked, you feel like you don't have any friends, you feel like you don't have any time to have friends, you feel like you don't have a life, you feel like you're not a very good mom, but hey, let's take a picture of Got It Together Mom. And we hide that. You, we, we do, we put that stuff away and we hide it and we try to squash it down, we throw that veil up, we don't want people to see it. How about dad at the park? Taking the selfie with your kids at the park. Look, I'm pushing my kid on a swing. I'm a good dad. I'm a good dad. And in reality, you feel like a failure because you've just been short with your kids. You had a stressed out week at work and you come home and your kids are begging for your time. But here's the dad I want you to see. Here's a good one. Maybe it's Mr. and Mrs. Universe. Here's my protein shake. I'm getting in shape. But the truth is, you just ate a whole bag of chips and you worship regularly at the altar of Ben and Jerry's. I had to throw something in to make you laugh. Might be true. Or this one. Married couple of the year. Married couple of the year. I'm with my honey, my best friend. I love her. I love him. We have such a great marriage. But in reality, marriage really isn't that good at all. You're struggling. It's been hard. But here's the me I want you to see. Can I soapbox just for a second? I'll have another one later. Married couples, don't wait till your relationship is stage four dying. Invest in your marriage because marriage isn't perfect. It'll never be perfect. And you have to work at it. You you hear me push this so much. You have to work at it. If you have issues and you have problems and you can't deal with them on your own, find an outside source to help you do it. There's no shame in that. In fact, I consider that to be strength. That's strong. Seeking God. Seeking godly advice. Godly help to get you through those struggles and make you better. It doesn't mean that your marriage is failing. It just means that you want your marriage to get better. And maybe some of you are like, PR, does this mean that you're always honest and show everything on social media? Yes, I always try to be honest. But no, I'm not showing you everything on social media. I don't. For example, if I tweet on Saturday before I preach the, you know, the, the Sunday service, if I t- put something out on Sunday morning, well, I'm really excited about today's message. I, that means I'm really excited about today's message. But here's just a few things that might really be going on. I'm exhausted. I'm in a bad mood. I haven't had a day off and who knows when. I don't even know if the message makes sense. I don't know if I put it together. I don't even know if I heard God because my mind is such a rattled mess. I can't figure out what I'm trying to say. It's probably going to be horrible. I just want to go to bed with a new package of Chips Ahoy and a gallon of milk and then sleep for three days. And you chuckle. But sometimes that's the truth. Sometimes you don't want to be here. Sometimes the, the, you're just like Moses. And I'm just like Moses. And we come in and we throw on the veil because we don't want anyone to see the real me. You know, the crazy thing about the story of Moses is God's glory might not have, it might have been fading. But Moses had just spent 40 days and nights with God. That in itself is amazing. 
Moses went up that mountain, an imperfect man, and he came back down that mountain, an imperfect man. But for some reason, I don't know. Oh, man, I just, I, all I want people to see is perfection. He couldn't be perfect, and you can't either. Man, I got shields running. I, it, I, that is good. You come in here with this veil on. You want people to see what you want them to see. Sometimes, sometimes it's just tough. Sometimes it's just tough. And can I say this? I know I'm getting kind of whatever today, but I really want us to get this. Everything we say must be true, but everything true does not need to be shared on social media. Some people are oversharers. I'm going to teach you for just a second as your pastor and someone that loves you. Okay? Some people are oversharers. If that's you, thus saith the Lord, shut thy trap up. I love you. I, I say that with love. I don't say that in meanness. There are some things that don't need to be shared. There's just not. You see people share stuff on Facebook all the time. Pray for my husband. He's the biggest jerk who ever lived. I can't stand him. I don't want to be married to him another day. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ redeems his soul, I have no place in my heart for this man. Please pray for my husband. I'm like, darn straight, I'm praying for your husband. Pray for my kid. She's rebelling. That's going to help your kid, isn't it? Ain't nothing wrong with asking people to pray for your kid. Would you please pray for my kid? Pray for my kids. I ask him to pray for my kids all the time. Well, what happens when your kid reads that? Social media is not the place where you always remove the veil. But you have to remove it face to face. We have to be real. So we put this veil on, we post something. Did you like that? Didn't you like it? Did you like it? We want affirmation. We want it to feel good, and yet we feel so empty. Go back to verse 15. This is what Paul said again. Verse 15, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers our heart. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil cover our hearts. So this is something that I want us to grab today. A veil that covers the face eventually covers the heart. A veil that first covers the face eventually covers your heart. Why is that? Because we get used to this. So what we get used to, we get used to the veil. We get used to portraying. We get used to letting people see who we want them to see. And eventually it becomes so natural that it just slides its way down and it becomes who we are. Once our heart is affected, then we are affected. Does that make sense? So many people today, if you ask them if anybody knows the real you, so many people would say no. And if you ask them why, a lot of people would say, I, I, I'm scared to death of what they might see. I'm scared to death of what they might think. You know, I think about Moses coming down that hill. Even if he didn't have had that glow, oh my goodness, he came down that hill and he was able to, I just spent 40 days and nights with God. That is amazing. Is that not amazing? Why in that moment did he think that, oh, I need that glory. I need that glory shining. I, need, I, I, gotta, I want people to still see that glory shining because that makes me more of, and, and I'm not saying that's what was going through his mind. I'm just kind of using that. There was a reason that he put that up. Oh, I want people to see this because they'll like me more. I'll be a better leader. I'll be a better pastor. I'll be a better servant. I'll be a better teacher. I'll be a better this. I'll be a better mom. I'll be a better dad. By the way, parents, don't be afraid of showing your kids the reality of who you are. This is not just some 20-something-year-old problem. There's those of, man, the older we go through this stuff, people say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. How's your marriage? Oh, it's fine. You guys know what I'm talking. How are you doing in your relationship with God? Yeah, it's great. Really, is it great? Is it great? Because if I'm speaking today, and, and, and then that, especially that one, and you know when I say that, it's just like, man, that's me. It doesn't have to be. 
It doesn't have to be you. Your answer could be, my relationship with God is amazing. I'm an imperfect person. I've made a mistake. I made a mistake this morning. But he loves me and God is so good. Sometimes it's okay that when somebody, how's life? Man, it's pretty tough right now. It's, I'm just going through this. And I'm not, t- listen, I'm not saying open your closet and share more than you should. But sometimes you just got to find those people to be real with, right? Just take the veil off. Just get rid of it. I'll show you how in just a minute. Some people are so used to showing the fake self. They don't even know who the real self is anymore. Remember, if the veil, when the veil first covers the face, it'll eventually cover the heart. It's crazy. Does this person like me? And eventually we're just living for likes, longing for love. Can I just share one more soapbox? Do I have your permission to get on one more soapbox? Thank you. This one's real. Because some people say, do you like my picture? Do you like my, you know, my filter? Do you like my caption? Do you like my shirt? Do you like my earrings? Do you like my house? Do you like my car? Do you like my kids? Well, some people are out there. Do you like my body? Oh, it got quiet. You know why people post revealing and provocative pictures of themselves? If they really took the veil off, they don't like their bodies or themselves, so they show as much as they can to get the affirmative response and make them feel better. That's not every issue, but it's a lot. Cover it up! Cover it up! I'm not saying anyone in this church is doing it, but if you see, man, cover it up. And there's nothing wrong with, with, with if you love someone and you're, what, just cover it up. Just cover, man, we don't need, cover it up. It's that simple. Just cover it up. Sometimes you show too much. People show too much. I don't want to be seeing that. <laughs> Last one. Soapbox, that is. Living for likes, longing for love. All right, let's get back where we're going. Okay, so, so, so what's the big deal? We're, we, when, we, when we're always filtered, when we're always showing our best side, we may impress people some, but they might be impressed, but we're not connecting. And the difference is this. The difference is this. We connect with people through our weaknesses. We connect with people through our weaknesses. When Moses finally connected with his people, it wasn't that glory that showed off of his face that caused that connection. Does that make sense? The connection came from Moses being real. The connection came from Moses' mistakes. <laughs> we connect with people through our weaknesses. We may impress them with our strengths, but we connect with them through our weaknesses. You've done this before. you met somebody and you're like, oh man, they're so perfect. I just can't stand them. And just look at their life. They just have everything. It's just, oh, I can't stand it. And then you sit down and you spend a little bit of time with them and you recognize and realize where they've been in their life, the struggles that they've had in their life. And then all of a sudden, instantaneous, you're like, man, I connect with them. They're pretty awesome. Well, they've come a long way. You didn't connect through the awesomeness. You connected through the weakness. You connected with with those problems. You connected with the mistakes. And so often we're trying to impress the world with, here's the me I want you to see, and yet we're longing for something more. We may impress people with our strengths. Moses probably impressed those people with the glory of God that he walked down that hill. But when that glory started fading, he had this fear that that impression was going to go away. So he throws this veil up to hide it. And that's immediately what we do. Oh, I don't want them to see my flaws. I don't want them to see my weaknesses. But in your weakness, in our weakness, what does the Bible say? Yes. Yes. We're getting it. By the way, I'm preaching to myself today. I promise you. So what do we do now? At this point, normally I would give you some kind of practical suggestion like just try to be yourself. That's good advice. Just be you. Just be you. Just be the real you. Great advice. Don't use a filter every time. Try just posting. If you're, gonna, if you're a selfie person, just try posting you. That's good advice. Try not to care what other people think. That's pretty good advice too. But more than good advice, I want to give you some godly advice. And it's found in the scriptures that we've read today, and I don't want you to miss this. Because in, in essence, this is the whole message. And it's this. Only Christ can remove the veil. 
only Christ. If you have thrown this veil up, it's going to. You hide your face long enough, it's going to hide your heart. The only one that can remove it is Jesus. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter or 3, 16. But when any, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, what happens? See, we turn to ourselves. We turn to others. We're trying to get these likes and all of this stuff. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You know why he takes it away when we turn to him? Because he sees us for who we really are, and that's enough. In fact, it's more than enough. How do I know that? Because he created me to be me. He created me to be me. When you turn to God, he doesn't need to see you through a filter. He doesn't want to see you through a filter. So he just says, get that thing away. Let's get out of here. I know you're not perfect. I know you messed up. Just get that out. I don't need to see that. I want to see you because you are who I created. Some of you this morning, you're turning to everyone and everything else for affirmation. Why don't you try turning to God today? Just stop listening to people. Stop longing for likes and loves and happy faces. Just turn to God and let Him have it. When you turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away, and then suddenly you're not getting approval from people's likes. You're getting approval from His love. And that's what's life-changing. When I realize that He is all that I have, suddenly I realize that He is all that I need. And I don't need approval from someone else because I get approval from him. Fold that up, put that in your pocket, take it with you. That's an everyday thing. My approval, I I want people to like me, I want people to love me, but my approval does not come from people, it comes from God. Go back to verse 17. Where the Spirit of the Lord, there's what? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Say that again. Yeah. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's freedom. Don't need no veil. We don't cover anything up. There's freedom. Verse 18 again, and we all who with unveiled faces, this is important. And we all, who with unveiled faces, this is who I am, wrinkles, black eyes, mistakes, and all. This is who I am. When I, this, is, this is what I'm showing you. With unveiled faces, we all, and notice the we. Key word, we, and we all. Every single one of us. There is power when a bunch of people let Jesus take the veil off together. Why? Because we see the reality of who God is. We see the reality of what God can do. And honestly, this is what goes back to Cross Point Church pointing people to a real relationship with a real God. It's not just about me. It's not just about you. But man, when we get this and then we get this with each other, oh my goodness, when we all come together as imperfect people, as people that have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, who have made mistakes, who made mistakes last night, and even made mistakes this morning. When all of us come together in all of that junk, we are being transformed into his image. That should make somebody excited. Now, they just spit on this side. His image with the everlasting glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom Freedom to be me. There's freedom to be me. There's freedom for me to be who I am, who I'm created to be. There's freedom for me to worship the way that I want to worship, to sing the way that I want to sing, and to play the way that I want to play. 
to love people the way that I'm, I'm supposed to love them, free of condemnation from people. Well, who is he to love somebody? I'll tell you who I am to love somebody. I am a child of the King, and so are you. And you know what that gives me? By knowing Jesus, the same Spirit that conquered the grave now lives inside of me. And it lives inside of you. That's what I want people to see. I don't care if they see a messed up mitt fit. I don't care. I just want them to see Jesus. With unveiled faces. Because life is always better together. We contemplate the Lord's glory. It's not about me. It's not about a selfie-centered world. Everybody say freedom. Freedom. Oh my goodness. How do we get unveiled faces? When you turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And we're transformed into the image of Christ. Not for the approval of people, but for the glory of God. And that's how we follow Jesus in a selfie-centered world. So I have two hashtags this week. You can go to the very, very, I put the, the, the first one's just be real. Uh, but the second one is freedom. We need to stop being bound by the likes of people and start living in the love of Christ. And when we do that, it's life-changing. It'll change your family, your marriage. It'll change you. It'll change you. It'll change me. It'll change me. Just turn to God. If you don't like who you see, turn to Him. Let Him take the veil off. Let Him see you for who you really are, who He created you to be. And if that's enough for Him, it should be enough for you.